although people are obviously still joining us, we've got a very tight schedule. So I think I'm going to start, in fact, um, and people just have to come in um, as we proceed. But um, I just wanted to say that um, this has been put on by the St. James and Bardenton Community Association, which, um, as you probably know, occupies the kind of eastern part of the central ward of Hereford and is sort of bounded to the south by the River Wye and incorporates actually in, in our ward a huge swathe that's um, surrounded by a vast meander in the Wye, ending in the sewage works of all things. Might be re relevant to tonight. Um, but today, we, because of the wider interest of, of this topic, we wanted to extend it outwards um, and uh, hopefully appeal to pe people from, from places outside our immediate community. So I'm the chairman of the St. James and Barbington Community Association, otherwise known as JABBA. And our secretary here is here, Elaine Underwood, who really um, should take credit for having put this, this together, this meeting this evening. We're assisted by Ruth Westby from our partner um, community group, uh, Friends of Bartonshire Meadows, who you'll have gathered from my description are sort of bang on our doorstep with, with the, um, with the Bartonshire Meadows, which are of course an area which could well have been implicated in some pollution over the winter in the floods. Um, we, uh, Ruth is doing the IT so that as you gathered already, um, recording is going on and you can opt out of that if you wish to. Um, and she will be handling the, the chat and the screen sharing. I should just refer very quickly to a couple of relevant um, things to do with this subject. First of all, if you haven't seen it, I would thoroughly recommend George Monbiot's film Riverside, spelled River C-I-D-E, The Death of Rivers. And that is on YouTube and easily found. I should also bring us right up to date with um, the latest position with our MP who spoke in Prime Minister's Question Times time yesterday on a, on a happier subject than some of them. Um, although it is, of course, about the state of the Y, which is, is um, in a bad state. So that can also be seen um, on YouTube. We've got a lot to pack in. We're going to have four speakers and um, they will be dealing with different aspects. Uh, in 10 to 15 minutes, I have to emphasize that brevity is going to be the, the source of uh, our getting through. And uh, I ask everybody participating, whether a speaker or otherwise, to, to bear that in mind. Um, the, at the very end, the speakers will be available for question and people can make brief, again, comment. So I'd like now to, oh, and I wanted to mention as well that our very hardworking Ward Councillor Jeremy Milne is here. And thank you for coming, Jeremy. So I'm going to hand you over at this point to our secretary, Elaine, who you need to unmute, Elaine, um, will in, uh, tell you something in the shape of the meeting and introduce you to our first speaker. Thanks, David, and welcome to everybody. Um, just to sort of say what we've been doing about this issue of the why ever since we watched Riverside by George Monbiot, which makes anyone want to stand up and scream and do something. We've been trying to promote this uh, issue in terms of creating awareness and creating action through our Facebook page and through our newsletters and tonight with this meeting. So do have a look at our Facebook page. I know some of you don't like Facebook, but on it at the moment, 
There's a planning application you might like to object to at the end of this meeting because it closes tomorrow for objections. It's to double the size of a poultry shed just outside of Hereford in St. Owen's Cross from four sheds to seven. Uh, the manure would flow into the Gamber Brook, into the Garen, and then into the Y. There's already 200 objections, but why not add your own and, and, and help do something about this, this problem? There's a petition on our Facebook page to the Welsh Government asking for, uh, or Parliament rather, asking for a moratorium. And there's the Jesse Norman clip. So we, and we do try to link to the other Facebook groups with posts from what they're doing. Save the Y, Three Wise Women, Friends of the Lower Y, Friends of the Upper Y. It's all there on our page. We also spent a lot of time um, last summer trying to get a more coordinated citywide approach to pulling up the balsam. With our friends at Bartonshire Meadows, we spent quite a lot of time on working groups trying to pull up the balsam in the meadows. And then some individuals spent literally weeks <laughs> continuing that job and, and trying to go further up the river, up into Bishop's Meadow. And I talked to several of the councillors, I talked to Balfour Beatty, trying to get more action. Um, at which point we ran out of steam and the balsam was, was very high and very strong. So we're starting early this year in January with the aim of getting more Hereford-based river groups involved and perhaps looking at their own little patch. So hopefully we've got people here from the rowing club, the anglers, the sea cadets, friends of Castle Green, um, maybe Cathedral School, maybe the cleanup group. Between us, we ought to be able to do a bit more about the river because Balfour Beatty do not think that's part of their job remit. So it's down to us hardworking volunteers. So at the end of this meeting, we have um, some, some opportunities that we'll mention to get involved in that. We're hoping to launch something on the 14th of May. So just a date to throw out there um, for now and one we'd like to to start doing a bit more about the Himalayan balsam at least. With which, um, let me introduce our first speaker who is Dr. Tom Tibbetts. I think Friends of the Upper Y that Tom chairs were one of the first groups to respond to the problems of the Y. And you may have seen him on Countryfile um, showing them how the citizen science testing works which has been very much part of what they do. So Tom, over to you to tell us a bit more about the work you've been doing and perhaps how some of us can help. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Elaine and David for inviting me to this meeting. Um, I'm delighted to spend my precise allotted time of 15 minutes and no more <laughs> in telling you uh, all about the activities of Friends of the Apple Why. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen so you can all see what I'm talking about. And then I hope um, you can all see it now and we shall continue. So um, Friends of the Upper Y, uh, that's me on the riverbank uh, teaching a group of volunteers uh, to give them the, the necessary training in, in how to use the testing equipment so that we get uh, consistent and accurate results from, from our volunteers. A um, little bit of background, we were formed um, it, sort of informally in July 2020, a group of us got together in really in response to the media reports at the time and, and also the visible blooms in the river. Um, uh, it, it, we, we started off just being grouped around Hay on Y um, and we started by just doing a bit of research into you know, educating ourselves of the issues of, of river pollution and what was causing what to happen and so on. Um, we've since then come a little bit further, we've become a formally constituted organisation, we even have our own bank account, um, and uh, I should also just briefly mention our name. We would have been Friends of the Y were it not for a group in Kent that had already managed to grab that particular name, so we decided to go for the Upper Y. Um, but we did deliberately choose a geographical reach which included both England and Wales, because unlike pretty much every other administrative regulator or 
council in this land, um, we, we, we wanted to really try and understand what was happening both sides of the border, because of course the river respects no borders. Um, a quick, a brief timeline. So yeah, initially in July, planning what to do. Um, I actually liaised with um, the Y Salmon Association in August of 2020, and uh, because we'd already alighted upon the idea of, of doing some testing, because it was apparent to us that the testing done by the regulators effectively been slashed as a result of austerity. And uh, the, the testing network and the frequency of testing had been cut right back. So there was very little information about what and where was pollution entering or, or leaving the river. Um, we uh, then began fundraising towards the winter of 2020 for a pilot program. And I'm delighted to say that having attended a fantastic nutrient management board meeting, which is chaired by the wonderful Alyssa Swinglehurst, who I think is at this meeting, um, we uh, were given some seed funding for our first project in uh, January 2021 by the Environment Agency. Um, by March, we'd finalised our first testing plan and, and launched our website. Uh, in May, we then spent the money to procure equipment and we started training our volunteers in June, uh, six or seven months ago. Um, we have spent all the money by Christmas time um, but I'm glad to say we have just at the 11th hour secured further money from the lottery to keep us going for another six months. At this point, um, like all voluntary organisations, we couldn't have got to where we've got to without um, friends and partners from other parts of the world or other, other, other parts of society. And there is a long list of all the people we've engaged and there's probably some I've, I've missed off unintentionally. Um, but uh, I particularly want to stress um, Cardiff University of School of Environmental Sciences, they have been really fantastic in um, lending academic rigour and credence to the uh, testing programme that we've developed. Um, and we think that by partnering with, a, with a, a rigorous academic body, that's also managed to advise us on training volunteers and auditing our processes, uh, that we really are able to use our volunteers to pr produce data that is, is worth uh, worth examining and worth taking notice of. Um, I'd also like to um, thank the uh, YNS Foundation. They've been helpful to us. They've lent us a, a very small amount of hours and a staff member to help us organize things in the past. And also the Wildlife Trusts, uh, in particular Radnish Wildlife Trust, have been really helpful to us in securing insurance for our volunteers so that I don't personally end up being liable should a volunteer have an accident or, or worse during his or her testing. Um, alongside the Water Community Monastering, we've also run or tried to run a sort of creative community and cultural outreach program called Lift the River. Um, and we developed a website and a, an Instagram and a Facebook page where members of the public could in interact, upload what we call river samples, which could be anything from a poem to a picture to a photograph to a painting, to a song, you name it. And it's, but the whole point is that it, it, it brings the cultural significance of the river uh, into the forefront of people's lives and reminds us why the river is actually so important to us all. Uh, we've also been uh, looking at opportunities to get de designated bathing water status, much like the River Wharf up in Ilkley in Yorkshire. Uh, and we think that will also, um, if we are able to achieve that, um, that will significantly uh, improve the monitoring that is statutorily required by water companies of their discharges and, and the resulting river, river water quality. So that, that would be quite interesting, at driving river water quality improvement, we think. Um, we've also had regular meetings with our membership with relevant bodies, such as farming groups, campaign groups, MPs, uh, and we try also obviously to advocate for the river. Um, very briefly, I'm going to tell you what we measure in the citizen science. Um, effectively, we're, we're interested in two main pollutants, nitrates and phosphates, um, because they are drivers of algal blooms, which ultimately lead to uh, the eutrophication and death of all other life in the river. And, uh, but we've also been doing um, measures of turbidity and electrical conductivity, um, which has to be paired with temperature, because electrical conductivity is dependent on temperature. 
Um, but those two metrics, um, our partners at Cardiff think might be a useful proxy for detecting pollution incidents. Um, and that might be useful in low cost um, continuous monitoring technology that can be put up and down the catchment relatively easily and without requiring an army of volunteers to operate it. Uh, and that could give sort of real time warnings if the natural conductivity suddenly changes then that is a clue that there might have been some kind of uh, pollutant event happening in that particular body of water. And we are also um, taking photographic observations and uh, we also ask our volunteers just to subjectively uh, comment on the level of water in the river flow conditions and if they can see any signs of obvious pollution. Um, we have a team philosophy and that's worked to a greater or lesser extent um, across our tributary teams, but we've tried to form groups or call tributary teams, um, have a team leader in that group who has a, a slightly higher accuracy uh, device for measuring phosphates uh, and also to, to foster a bit of volunteer motivation and communication through WhatsApp groups. Uh, we hope that will help keep um, volunteers bravely going out in all weathers during the winter to, to do this valuable work. Here's a few photographs of some training in hay that we undertook in June 2021. You can see me there and a few other much more important volunteers. And there's some more photographs of our initial uh, kickoff training day at Glazebury um, on the other side of the border. This is um, some, some, some just basic statistics of some of the data that we, we are able to collect. On the left-hand side, you can see a graph of um, all, the, all the different sites uh, that we are collecting data from. In total, there's about 110. Um, and you can see the, the height of the graph shows you whether the number of samples that have been taken. So our, our group leader at that point on the 9th of December was uh, sample site number seven, who collected 50 data points in six months, which really is once, uh, sorry, twice a week, as, as we originally asked. And, and volunteers who perform at that level really are um, stars and deserve, uh, deserve medals, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've had about a 7% dropout rate of people who haven't particularly engaged. And I, I gather from volunteer activities that that's actually quite a good metric. Um, and on the right, you can see um, some corrected phosphate strip um, data that we've collected across all the site IDs. It, it's not terribly useful data because you can't see geographically where this is happening, but it, it gives you an idea of, of, of generally what we're seeing. At the bottom of the graph at zero, that's what we want to see everywhere, right? That's, that's zero pollution. That's what we like to see. The 0 0.03, that is on the, the um, target limit. Generally, it's that's the it's slightly higher in the lower Y, but generally that's the limit in the upper Y um, or lower of where phosphate should be. And so we're getting a lot of readings at the limit, and then any readings above the limit are effectively showing that there is excessive pollution detected by that particular reading. And, and of course, particularly worrying are these very very high um, uh, readings we're getting in very few places, and and quite a body of, of high readings. Uh, particularly around Hereford. Um, I shall move on to the next slide. A quick quick case study. We have a valiant volunteer on Cage Brook who's actually measuring three um, places, as you can see marked on the map in um, purple. We've got Artstone Court here, which is a sort of tributary of the, the Cage Brook. We've got Cage Brook here, which is being measured uh, where it, it, at the confluence of two of another tributary at a, at a Ford. And then we've got a third measurement point right down almost at the confluence of the Y. And you can see up at the Arkstone Court measurement point for the start stream that we are uh, measuring uh, relatively low phosphate uh, levels. I mean, I say relatively low, the average of those particular group measurements is still above the actual target limit, but it's not too far above the actual target limit. Um, actually, I'm just going to use that red line to show you what the actual target limit is of 0.03 milligrams per litre. Uh, but you see, as you go further down the brook, the pollution increases 
uh, and the average pollution at Cagebrook Ford is up to 0.2, which is almost eight times the target limit. And uh, by the time it hits the conference with the Y, it's increased further to almost 0.25 milligrams per litre. So you can see that even with one person doing a lot of work, we can quite quickly build up quite interesting information about what's happening along these brooks. And uh, we also hope to, to, to make the Environment Agency aware, or Natural Resources Wales aware of this. So um, in the most egregious cases, they can perhaps do their own work and find out what's going on. Um, I'll just quickly give you, um, I'll just quickly gloat, frankly, to you all a few recent successes we've had as a group. Um, we submitted a report to the Environmental Audit Committee, which um, was incorporated and extensively quoted in the final committee report that the committee made. Many of the recommendations we made have been carried forward uh, in the government, in, in, sorry, in the committee's report to the government. So um, we are very proud of that and, and we hope that um, it also encourages other community groups to get involved with our parliamentary democracy because um, we noticed that in the, this Environmental Audit Committee report, um, community groups, volunteers and citizen scientists were extensively uh, quoted and, and, and given a lot of um, airtime, so to speak, in the report. Um, we've also just started a partnership with a very big um, uh, construction engineering consultancy with the hydrology department that has a history that goes back over 100 years. Uh, I'm not sure if I can really reveal their name yet, um, but that is effectively um, us saying to them, please help us analyze our data. Uh, we don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the bandwidth to, to do all the data analysis that is needed now with all this data we're creating. But these guys have got a big corporate social responsibility budget and also lots of willing engineers who'd like to give a little bit back so we're engaging with a 12-month project with them and we hope in a few months time that'll really start to 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 paint our data in a um in a more user-friendly a more understandable way they will they, they they are bringing sort of computer wizards data scientist experts to this party and, and we really hope to sort of have things like interactive data websites and stuff that, that we can point people to and they can see for themselves what's going on. And I've put in the bottom there, water protection zone in brackets. That is because um, it's nothing to do with me, but I am delighted to say that the Nutrient Management Board at its most recent meeting did vote uh, to um, commence the process of exploring how a water protection zone which is effectively much stricter enforcement and regulation of farming rules uh, could be employed in the wine catchment to improve the situation. Uh, and I have put at the bottom there, it's, it's not as a direct result of our work, but we hope that we might at least have um, contributed to that result. Um, what we've learned so far, it's an awful lot of work to run a, a hundred strong team of citizen scientists. And I'm not the only volunteer on the committee. There's 10 others of us. Uh, and uh, all of them deserve a, a huge round of applause and a lot of gratitude. Um, they've given a lot of their time and effort. And um, data is being produced and analysis has begun. Uh, if you are a data scientist or are interested in seeing the data, um, email science at fauw.org.uk and we can give you access um, to it. Um, and if you fancy doing a, a PhD, I, I expect there's several PhDs that could be got out of analyzing the data that we're producing. Uh, and future ambitions, we're still raising money. And to that end, we have a new crowdfunder that's just gone live that's being promoted for us by River Action UK, which is a sort of UK wide river protection charity. So if you uh, Google crowdfunder River Action, if you'd like to contribute to what we're doing, um, what I always say is every pound given to us is worth about 60 pounds given to a regulator. We like to think we spend it well. Um, and um, we also hope to deepen our links with the Wildlife Trust because they are fantastic at volunteer management and have lots of teams of excellent people who can do that. Um, and with the money we hope to raise, ultimately it's all about um, taking a bit of the weight off volunteers' shoulders and, and creating a job so that we've got someone running the science team uh, and someone running the, the, the creative outreach team. It may, they may be separate people, they might be the same person, but that, that's our ambition. And uh, really, the most important thing we want to do is make sure that the data we're collecting is taken notice of, 
by the regulators and by anyone else who can use it to affect change for the river. And that includes Natural Resources Wales, who I hope are listening. Thank you very much. I hope Thank I left a few minutes for questions. Um, yeah, I think we'll have questions um, uh, at the end of uh, the, the various speakers, Tom. Thank you very Thank much. You. That, no was, that was very concise, although um, I can see we're going to have a problem. I'm going to have a problem getting everything squeezed into the time because we're hoping to finish by nine, but um, I may be asking people to bear with us. So without more ado, I'd like to um, move on to our second speaker to introduce very briefly, Nikki Moore, who's a project officer for the Wye Valley area of natural beauty. And she will be talking to us about principally, we hope, Nikki, uh, the invasive species and how one can effectively deal with them. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, David. Right, I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully find. Okay. How does that look? Can we, can you see that okay? We can see your screen. We can also see your forthcoming slides down the side if you do want to go to slideshow mode. It should, it's probably a bit of a lag period. How does that look now? We can still see your forthcoming. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Super. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to um, present to you this evening. I'm absolutely delighted. Um, so I'm Nikki, and um, I'm the Wye Valley AOMB, or Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, um, Lower Y Project Officer. And um, I joined the small staff unit. We're based in Monmouth um, in March 2020. Um, delivering various projects to improve um, public walking routes, um, also to assist landowners in installing natural flood management measures, and also to tackle the growing threat of invasive non-native species. Um, also, in my spare time, I'm currently setting up a new volunteer group in my village in the Brecon Beacons National Park to um, work with landowners to tackle Himalayan balsam. So um, I must be a bit obsessed, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's great to be able to, to see this from both angles, from uh, the perspective of a volunteer and also a, a partnership sort of staff member. So um, I've titled um, tonight's talk, um, Tackling Inns, so that's Invasive Non-Native Species and the what, why, when and how of all of that. So I'm going to try to make this talk as, as practical as I can, because um, that's really what we all need to do is to get practical and to get hands on. Um, but before I move on to that, I would um, just like to um, just mention um, for those who would like to know a bit more about the Y Valley AOMB, um, about the staff units work and about the partnership. Um, please do visit our website. There it is um, in the middle at the bottom of the, the screen. Um, and also we've got various social media channels. Um, we're really active on social media um, and we um, you know, help sort of promote the, the full breadth of the partnerships work as well. So um, um, yeah, do, do check in and, and have a look at those. Um, and I also wanted to just, just quickly check, um, give you a sort of lay of the land, um, the geography. Um, so the Wye Valley AOMB, it runs from just north of Mordeford, so downstream of Hereford. Um, and it flows um, and it, it um, then extends down towards Chepstow. So we, we've got two thirds um, of the AOMB is in England and a third in Wales. So I very much empathize with you, Tom, uh, about working across borders um, and the, the logistics and technicalities of all of that. And um, yeah, we, we, we're doing that on a daily basis. <laughs> so um, I'm with you on that. Um, so, yeah, our staff unit works within the designated area, and I'm actually funded to work below Monmouth in the lower Y Valley area. Um, but we do sit on partnerships such as the Y Catchment Partnership, and we work closely with the YNS Foundation also. So, um, you know, we do work beyond our boundary to support and influence projects that will help to improve the quality of life down with us downstream. Um, and as you'll see later, we're also developing tools which we hope will be used by community groups, the length and breadth of the why, if, if not further. So the work we do is, is not exclusively, um, all exclusively within, within the AOMB. 
Um, so my topic tonight is, is one particular invasive non-native species or INS, but I uh, just want to give you um, a bit of context. Um, so non-native species and invasive non-native species are those that are introduced by humans, whether that's deliberate or a result of human activity. And INS, invasive non-native species differ in that they cause harm to the economy, um, to the health and, and the natural world. Um, they're also estimated to cost our economy over 1.8 billion annually. Um, and that's, that's likely to be an underestimate. And that's through the, the control and eradication effort. Um, some invasives uh, reduce, the, reduce house prices. There's also damage to infrastructure, increase in flood risk and so forth. And it's now very well documented that invasive species are the second greatest threat to biodiversity after habitat loss and fragmentation. They outcompete native species and often harbor diseases and pests that our native species are susceptible to. So their presence significantly contributes to the loss of our native flora and fauna. And one of the key roles of the AOMB staff unit is to lever in project funding. And we've been really successful in securing a number of different funds for INS work, but these are always restricted geographically, whether in an English or Welsh county or a specific sub catchment or a community. So for simplicity, um, we decided to unite all those funds and we launched the Y Invasive Species Project or WISP last year. And I'm sure you'll all recognize that tall pinky purple flower in the logo there. So through WISP, we're tackling three INS. We're tackling Japanese knotweed, we're tackling American skunk cabbage and Himalayan balsam. And the focus tonight is uh, Himalayan balsam, one of our most successful INS. It loves our lowland climate, and it is believed still to be a very long way before it reaches its climactic range here in the UK. It's a very familiar site um, around most of our UK river catchments now, so I won't go into the ID, the, the identification, but um, if you would like to just gen up on a, a, that a, you know, a bit further, then there are identification sheets on our website. And also the Great Britain Non-Native Species Secretariat website has a whole host of tools, um, really useful um, lab, um, information on that. So, so do check that out if you'd like to understand further um, how it looks at various stages of its life cycle. Um, it is a relative of the busy Lizzie. It's a pretty plant and it does attract pollinators in abundance. So to some, it, it might, you know, people might look at the riverbank and just think it's a great thing for our declining bee populations. But do spare a thought for all of those native flowering plants that are going unpollinated. Himalayan balsam holds the title of UK's tallest annual plant now, and it has the highest growth rate of any plant in the herb layer. And once it's found a, a favorable site and gained a foothold, it quickly outshades other plants. It ultimately reaches two to three meters or six to 10 feet in height, and it forms a dense dark monoculture. So anything underneath will, will die off. And growing so densely, it can often fall into water courses and has led to increased flood risk in some areas. Um, and the problem carries on. <laughs> Being an annual, it dies back completely with the first frosts. Ordinarily, riverbanks in the UK are covered in vegetation all year round. Um, we're getting used to seeing these bare riverbanks, but that is not a natural phenomenon. It's, it's unusual. Um, and that vegetation, um, the, the native vegetation, has the vital function of, of stabilizing the earth through winter rainfall and the peak river flows. Um, so having bare earth banks obviously increases erosion, which reduces our water quality and it causes a loss of habitat for wildlife, such as water voles, kingfisher. Recent studies have also shown that balsam actually affects the mycorrhizal network in our soils as well, making it harder for native species to recolonize that bare soil. It is quite a phenomenal plant. Um, and the explosive method of seed dispersal um, enables plants to fire hundreds of seeds up to seven meters away. And these seeds are readily transported by water, but they can also be moved about on our footwear and on hedge trimming machinery, for example. So it's a species that's very much on the move. 
So onto the, quickly onto the legislation side of things. So it is listed under Schedule 9 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which means it is an offence to plant or uh, allow this species to grow in the wild. And there's no obligation to eradicate it from land or to report its presence. But if it does spread into the wild, then you could be liable as landowner or manager. But we also do need to bear in mind that Himalayan balsam, balsam spreads incredibly easily and many landowners and managers are unwitting recipients of balsam coming from downstream, from upstream, sorry. Um, and they can suddenly be faced with a mammoth control task um, that is daunting and costly. So supporting landowners and controlling balsam is, is really important in this battle. Um, and I have seen sadly some unpleasant exchanges on social media, especially during Himalayan balsam flowering season which casting blame, which is, is just never going to help. So moving on, um, the Great Britain strategy for INS adopts a three tier hierarchy approach to um, invasives. And at the top there, prevention. Prevention is better than cure. Um, it has yeah, the highest priority and it's where the most efforts need to go. But Awareness raising, that sort of thing, is often relegated to the if we have time pile, unfortunately. Um, but awareness raising is critical. Um, and, you know, amongst the public and amongst landowners, there is still a, a high level of, of a lack of understanding about the threats that the balsam poses. Um, in terms of biosecurity measures, um, you know, posters that raise awareness of how balsam seeds spread. Um, posters requesting people to avoid going near the plants and washing footwear after balsam bashing events, that sort of thing. That's, that's biosecurity. Um, the next phase, uh, next to the hierarchy is detection and surveillance. So it's getting it located on that map. The greater the chance, um, the earliest the detection, uh, the greater the chance of success of eradicating it and the lower the costs in terms of biodiversity and other resources. And then, of course, there's the control and eradication side of things. Um, and this is obviously needed once an invasive species has established and it's at high risk of spreading. Um, so this is where we are with balsam um, and this is what I'll, I'll focus on next. So. Whilst eradicating balsam in the entirety of the Y catchment is, is highly desirable, currently for, for many reasons, it is, is just not feasible. Um, for example, there is no catchment scale coordination. Um, the extent to which it's spread and the cost of bringing it under control. Then there's the complexity of land ownerships. There's um, the terrain, which is difficult on, on steep riverbanks. And of course, the low level of, of public awareness I've mentioned, just, just to name a few of the reasons. However, at a site level, if it is tackled as soon as it appears, then eradication is possible. Um, and if unfortunately it's become established at a site, if control is carried out consistently, it can be eradicated. And also at a larger scale in the lower Y, we've proven that with volunteers adopting a sub catchment approach, starting hand pulling at the most upstream extent of balsam and working downstream, balsam can be eradicated from whole tributary catchments. So there is a huge amount we can do through pre prevention, detection and control. So there are a number of methods uh, for controlling balsam. So we've got obviously manual pulling that I've mentioned, AKA balsam bashing, but there's also mechanical cutting and chemical and biological. So there, there are rust trials underway at the moment and also livestock grazing. But uh, I'm gonna focus on manual hand pulling, the balsam bashing, because that's something we can all do very easily and at no cost other than our time, of course. Um, and also where it's safe to do so and when done correctly, hand pulling is, is actually the best method as it's the most targeted and it's gentlest for native species. Plus it's fairly easy, it's really good fun and it's really satisfying. So this is a, an eight point plan and an equipment checklist that um, we've pulled together with, with partners to help volunteer groups um, organize themselves and, and organize balsam bashing events. 
And next, I've got a, a very full slide. Apologies, there's a huge amount on that to take in. Uh, but this provides guidance around how to pull up balsam most effectively and how to best dispose of it. Um, there's also biosecurity advice um, and what kit you need. And uh, there's a time frame there at the bottom around balsam pulling. So um, brilliantly, balsam has a really small, shallow root network, um, which when you grip the base of the stem, it's easily pulled out with a very satisfying tug, actually. And um, if it snaps at the node, you need to pull it again to make sure you include the roots. Otherwise, the balsam will reshoot um, and send up new flower heads and probably more than if you hadn't touched the plant in, in, in the first, time, first instance. Um, and then the recommended approach is then to snap the stem between the root and the first node, just to make sure that it, it doesn't reroot. And in terms of disposal, um, it can be piled up on site and away, away from a watercourse, just to make sure it doesn't get washed into the, to the stream or river. And then it does quickly rot down. Um, we actually pile up the roots, making sure that they're off the ground um, using stones or tree trunks where they will dry out and die. Um, and in terms of timing, hand pulling can start as early as March. Um, if you're good at your ID, um, being able to identify the, the younger plants. Um, but by May, uh, the plants are, are nice and large enough to be recognized easily. And pulling should continue through June prior to seed formation, really essential. Um, although some plants can germinate later in the season, so hand pulling may need to continue through to the autumn. So the optimum time for control is when the Himalayan balsam is just starting to develop its flower buds. And follow-up work will be needed into the autumn to tackle any late germinating or, or small plants that have been missed in the initial pulling. And the great news is the Himalayan balsam seeds are only viable for up to 18 months. So it is possible to eradicate your site of balsam within two years of control. Um, of course, if you're on a water course where balsam is growing upstream, you will need to keep at it whilst also gently influencing community action upstream of you if you can. The next slide is um, that mechanical control. Um, so this includes slashing, strimming, mowing, scything. Uh, this is often carried out when the scale of the task is just too daunting for hand pulling, um, and also when access and terrain permits and the landowner and funding permits, um, and also where there are no native species interspersed with, with the, the balsam. Um, I won't go into this method now. Um, of the, the time constraints. But um, if you'd like to know more and about other control methods, um, do look at the rapid management guidance for balsam on the WISP web pages um, on our website. So this is um, something that um, myself and my colleague Ellie are pulling to grad together um, pretty much as we speak. Um, it's an action group toolkit. And um, there, there is a toolkit on the Great Britain Non-Nature Species um, Secretariat website, um, but it is basically it's catch-all. It's covering all invasives uh, that you'd find in the UK. Um, so we're producing one specifically for balsam. And um, yeah, being running, setting up a community group myself, I'm actually going to be user testing it as well. So um, I'll be, be sort of checking it out from, from both angles, which is, is quite useful really. Um, so yeah, I get oft asked often um, in my work how residents, by residents, how they can go about setting up a group and getting volunteers engaged. So um, this toolkit will include advice um, around all of these aspects. So how to get mapping um, and recording your um, Himalayan balsam. And um, yeah, there's a little sort of picture there of iRecord, which is um, a super sort of national recording system. Um, then also how to get the support and consent from the you know, people that really matter. Also how to make sure that you're covering all the health and safety and first aid and risk assessment aspects of, of your community group's work. Um, also looking at insurance, making sure that you've got cover there and that you're taking all um, necessary measures uh, in terms of biosecurity and you've got all the sort of right kit and things. Um, so we're hoping to launch this toolkit at the end of March, and um, I'd love it, Elaine, if um, you could provide some feedback on that as well. Um, that would be, be really super with your um, community group's work. Um, yeah, the more sort of user testing and, and feedback we can get on that, 
the better it's going to be. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, we're going to be putting it on our website, but um, we're going to be promoting it as far and wide as we can. As I say, I said earlier, it's not going to be restricted to the, the AOMB by any means. Um, and I do hope it will, will prove useful to community groups who want to get out and get active um, tackling balsam. So um, finally, this is um, a really important date for everyone's diaries. Um, we've got uh, this, the, the, the picture on um, one side is, is Invasive Suites 2021. The Non-Native Species Secretariat has, has been running this for a, a few years now. Um, there's some statistics from, from their last year's event. And we're hoping to team up with them this year and really beef those statistics right up um, in terms of sort of how many um, social media posts and um, community events and uh, blogs and webinars and things. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got uh, quite, quite um, exciting plans for our own WISP campaign. And we're going to be calling out for all community groups, not just in the AOMB, but the whole of the Y catchment to join with us and pull together a really, you know, as extensive a program mm -hmm. of, of community activities and online and on the ground um, as we possibly can. Um, so if you could get in touch with us, tell us what you're going to be doing. And um, we'd love to be able to, you know, we'd love to promote those activities on our um, website and on our social media channels as well. So um, I think that's it for me now. I think I've, I've probably had my time allocation um, and happy to take any, any questions yes, um, Nikki, later on. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, yeah, we, we are running over time. It's sort of getting progressively uh, a little later than scheduled but i think that's just sort of inevitable because yeah. like your predecessor speaker you've been very succinct um and you know it's just a measure of how much we're trying to pack in really but uh i'd like now to introduce nick day um who um is a founder member of the um friends of the lower y along with uh, mike dunsby and, and he, he will talk to us about uh, the group's response to tackling pollution and the various challenges that are faced uh, with pollution and invasive species. And I think probably, Nick, you're going to also be able to refer to the kind of liaison you're doing with other groups uh, within the catchment, which of course includes the lug. So over to you, um, Nick, then. Okay then, uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, David. Um, thank, thanks Elaine for inviting us. Um, I shall be handing across to, to my colleague, uh, Mike Dunsby in due course, but I'll just give a, a brief introductory background as, as to what we are. Uh, very much new kids on the, on the block. Um, six months ago, it, uh, Friends of the Lower Y was, better, wasn't in fact even, even a twinkle in Mike or, or my eye. Um, it, it all came about really partly through the George Monbiot film, The Riverside that you mentioned earlier, and partly through the Walking with the Y initiative, uh, where, whereby the, a wonderful group of people walk from, from the source to the sea. And whilst they passed through Tintern, Mike Dunsby and myself uh, found ourselves uh, together in, in Tintern Churchyard, in the churchyard of St. St. Michael's Tintern, saying not only someone ought to be doing something about this, but we must, in fact, what are we going to do about it? So what we did uh, is that we've, we've formed the Friends of the Lower Y, with a view to informing people and um, informing people locally and campaigning to get uh, get things fixed so that the river can return to a, a proper state of health. And in order to further inform that, we've also started a uh, citizen science program, uh, very much again in line with the Friends of the Upper Wives, uh, their approach. Um, and in fact, all the groups across the, the Y have, have been very much coordinated by uh, a lady called L. Von Benson at Cardiff University, who's uh, kindly done her best to, to make sure that uh, we all can uh, gather compatible data that we can all merge together if, at, at the end of the day in, into a, a meaningful uh, single database and, and look, at, look at that and see what, what the results are telling us across the, the entirety of, of the catchment. So the Friends of the Lower Wye, then the Friends of the Upper Wye come down to Hereford and include Hereford and indeed continue down then to the confluence with the Lug. Uh, we didn't feel we could take on the, uh, the, the Lug catchment itself, 
But we were aware that there was a, a Friends of the Lug and there are other groups also. And it turns out that CPRE Hereford uh, also uh, have an active interest in, in that region, not reasonably enough. Um, we then felt that, uh, well, there was basically no, uh, no um, if you like, social media uh, assistance, as it were, to people down below that confluence between, uh, between Y and Lug. So we, we formed Friends of the Lower Y as a Facebook group as well as a, an action group, um, as, as a Facebook group to, to co cope with the Y as it flows on down from, from there and all the other rivers entering into it with, within the catchment. So that also includes the, the Gamber and Garen, of course, uh, on, the, on the Welsh side, the, the Mono and the Trothy. And then across on the English side, we've got a number of, of quite small ones, but also we, we have the Valley Brook coming down from Clearwell and, and Newland. Uh, so all of these, all of these parts we, we feel we, we need to keep, keep an eye on. And the citizen science then en enables that the building of this this massive database covering the entire catchment which whereby we can we can look at it all and, and see what what's going on in in terms of pollution and excess nutrients going into the water which typically ends up then massively over encouraging the the, the excessive growth of, of algal blooms and so on and i think it's it's that that's really upset everybody to, to see the way the, the river has been, been going downhill because those then have choked out the, the possibility of everything else uh, existing within within that, that river river ecosystem. So towards um, further highlighting all of this, we've um, we've started numbers of, of campaigns of, of letter writing and things of that nature, and we've tried to advertise ourselves um, ourselves, Michael and myself, around a number of, um, of, of, of more, more more senior authority figures, if you like. And perhaps I could call Mike in at this stage to to uh, run you through some of the people we've been to to speak to about what we've what we've got in mind. Mike, Michael, are, are you there? Mr. Dunsby? You need to I'm unmute afraid. yourself, Michael. Mute, unmute. There we are. Sorry about that. Keeping technology. Right. Uh, we have no slides, so I will be clear and succinct and finish in two minutes. As Nick said quite rightly, our approach has been very much um, targeted at getting the MPs, the Welsh Parliament, um, water authorities and NRW very much involved in understanding the problems that we've got on the River Y and um, trying to get them to actually work together. What we have noticed in the past that everyone is blaming everybody else. Everybody else. It's a blame culture. So um, chasing up with David Davis, which is our MP in the South here, uh, and he very much links in with Jess Norman. So Jess Norman is understanding what we're doing through David Davis. And also we're trying to, and we have written to a number of occasions, to Mark Harper to actually meet with them. Um, we also have been chasing up the Royal Affairs Minister of the Senate, which is Leslie Griffiths, and Julie James, the Climate Change Minister. Uh, both those people have actually been targeted by our thousand followers uh, with letters to say, come on, get off your backsides, let's start talking. And in fact, David Davis did write a letter a few weeks ago to say that these people, the Welsh government, have got to take more of an interest within the why and what's happening on the why. Um, as Nick uh, said, we are talking and uh, aiming to talk and meet with the top people. Um, people like Peter Perry, who is the CEO of Welsh Water. We've had a meeting with him and uh, are continuing to, um, uh, to pursue him uh, to make decisions about cleaning up CSOs, etc., etc. We are pushing, though, very much for an interim solution. Um, all these authorities are saying that they have got plans afoot, um, a bill with doing peat bogs, lagoons, et cetera, et cetera, which will probably come really into good operation in 10, 15, 20 years time. Our problem is what we believe down here in the lower Y is that the river has possibly got five years before it goes over the eco top, if you know what I mean, it goes just too far within five years. So we are pushing very much for an interim solution to be installed now. Um, we have found one. Uh, I won't go into the detail now because we don't have time, but there is a product out there which we have sourced. It's an American stroke Australian product, and um, it uses natural enzymes being pumped into the watercourse, uh, which then the microplankton will uh, eat and it attaches itself to 
nitrates and phosphates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like I say, this isn't the this isn't the um, media to actually start presenting that to you, as we just just do not have time. But that's what we're doing. We're we're pushing for this interim solution um, to get installed. It's it's worked all around the world in lakes, reservoirs, and rivers. And uh, we believe it would be a great asset to the River Wye. So, um, as uh, Tom was saying, we had a very good meeting with CEO of Grant Wildlife Trust as well just this last week. So we are pushing these people, we are presenting this interim solution to them. And um, that's what we will continue to do. So uh, that's me, basically. Friends cool. of the Lower Wye. OK, again, thank you for that, Mike. And to say a little bit more after, after what Tom was telling us about the, uh, the state of pollutants in, in, in the Y, uh, it, it's widely known now, uh, understood and accepted um, that approximately 60% of the problem is, is down to uh, agricultural practices. Uh, the good news there is that there is growing awareness amongst farm, uh, the farming, farming community of the, the benefits of, of, of more, uh, more, shall I say, ecologically sensitive uh, approaches and regenerative farming approaches uh, so so that that's that's uh, moving in the right direction nevertheless there's 60 percent of the problem is nevertheless coming in from from various ag ag agricultural sources um and so the building up of, of our database is, is, is already starting to be useful uh, we've only had uh, our, our wider group of, uh, of of samplers going for for a few months now I've been training up numbers of further, further water samplers and testers uh, in, over the last sort of couple of uh, couple of weeks, and they've their, their, their results have started coming in. And I did a, a very brief uh, look at the at the database for the for the catchment as a whole, in order to try to uh, reach a stage where I can provide them some some feedback, and to give you all here a, a quick sneak preview. Uh, the, the news is basically that. Um, across the catchment, uh, up, up there in the upper Y, further up the upper Y, um, the, the, the mean levels of phosphates and nitrates are relatively low. And uh, as we saw that, that that specific example on the Cage Brook from Tom, thank you for that. Uh, yes, further up the rivers, things are all looking all looking, all looking, looking rosy and pollution levels relatively low. As we come down, things get worse. And indeed, especially when we reach the, the stage of, around Hereford, um, sadly, it's sad to say, suddenly there's a huge increase in, in levels of, of pollution in, in the water. Now that may well be as, as much sewage as anything, it may well be misconnections as well as the, uh, the, the sewage uh, plants themselves. Nevertheless, the, the, the problem ultimately is massive at that point. And it's only then as we, as we come further on down the river, actually the, the river starts to, to some extent, look after itself. But even when we've come, come all the way on down past Ross and Simmons Yacht and so forth and, uh, through Monmouth to, to the air, area where we're testing down here, which uh, is particularly uh, around Monmouth and, and Redbrook and also up the up Mono and Trophy at the moment. We're hoping to fill in one or two other places where, where some of the other groups aren't yet contesting. But uh, down at this point, we're still very much a long way over the, the recommended limits for, for these nitrates and phosphates. Um, so although the, the nature has a certain amount of ability to, uh, to repair herself, we're actually pouring in so much, so much pollutants that really something, something has to be changed in, in a big way. So again, thank you all very much for listening. Thanks for inviting us along and uh, best wishes to, uh, to, to Jabba, if I might say so. so thank yes, you very thank much. You much. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I'm glad you could join us, um, Michael. So thank you both very much indeed um, for really um, catching up a bit of time, actually. So well done. Um, well, we'll move now on to our final um, speaker, who is Steve Taylor, who is the chair of the Sea Cadets in Hereford and represents the Wyside Project, which um, is of great interest to us as it includes Bishop's Meadow as well. Um, so he will be able to talk about uh, the Wyside project, which is part of Hereford's Stronger Town Fund bid, and um, give us some details of this project. Now, we are very much aware, Steve, that uh, we would like you to come back, and we've discussed this with you. Uh, and in, in, uh, we, we hope to have a meeting on March the 10th of uh, our next community meeting, at which you hopefully will be able to expand a bit further on, on um, 
on the project and the, the pro progress it's making. And we're hoping very much that any kind of ideas that come out of this meeting that people have might still be able to get to you in time to be considered for incorporation in your final bid. Anyway, over to you, Steve. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the opportunity um, that you've given me to uh, show people what the Whiteside project actually is and what it's about. It's, I hope you all think it's something exceptionally positive for the river and also for Hereford itself. I've got a slideshow. I'm going to canter through it because, um, as David actually mentioned, I will be uh, attending a, a longer meeting and I can go into more depth. So we'll just... Start off. OK, so this is a project um, which was put together by the community for the community of Hereford as part of the Stronger Towns Fund. He says, uh, and it's made up of the Hereford Sea Cadets charity, uh, the Hereford Rugby Club, uh, who interestingly are not a charity, uh, the Left Bank Coffee Pot and the Hereford Rowing Club and also they're they're not a charity but all the people involved in this are volunteers our strategy is to address our youth clubs and communities across Hereford encourage activities that integrate the wider community um, all based around the the river develop more community links within Herefordshire highlight the heritage of the city of Hereford generate new skills, enhance the sport and tourism of the area, and open up commercial opportunities to develop new and exciting businesses. The executive is made up of one member from each of the four organizations I mentioned. Each member has to have decision-making mandate from its parent committee. Uh, they all meet in accordance with their Project Gantt chart, which they have. And the four have now generated a limited charity company so that we can deliver um, exactly what we said we would. So the proposal um, is to install two floating pontoons, a 20 meter pontoon for commercial uh, mooring and um, community use. That one will be at the left bank, a 37 meter pontoon replacing the current pontoon at the Sea Cadets for canoes, kayaks and small boat use. They both will have 12 meter retractable sloping gangways to take account of the river floods. We're also installing a one ton jib hoist mounted alongside the river bank and that's to allow easy movement of boats and equipment and as well as emergency services and also that allows disabled access down to the boats as well. We enhanced the two metre pedestrian walkway from the rowing club to the rugby club and installing a new fence line um, and that's to allow safe and easy access to the new pontoons. We're installing hookup power points for pop-up business pods on the north and the south side of the, the river, uh, installing in partnership with the local police force CCTV cameras for the safety and security covering both riverbanks, installing decorative lighting to the three bridges and improving access from the Great Western Way to the impaired uh, via uh, an impaired person ramp. The pictures that you see on this, this slide are just indicative of what we could potentially achieve within two years. The main areas, this is um, the north side where most of the work is taking place. If you can see my cursor, which I can't see my cursor, uh, there it is. This is the area here, Belvedere Lane, where the ramp will go in. And this will link the new pathway all the way along to the rowing club. It also enables access in this direction to the countryside and to the Water Works Museum. 
And the new pontoon will be in this area, as I said, replacing the current pontoon width, which is there. CCTV camera in this area, and this whole area now along here will have a fence line. There are a number of self-seeding trees here, and um, they will come down. There's about six of them. Uh, to offset that, the rugby club have planted 21 trees across Herefordshire. The trees along the Great Western will not be um, cut down, although the police will be cutting them back a bit. So just again, racing through, oh, I should go back, um, the pontoons, I've already said, we're replacing the, the current pontoon with the 37 meter pontoon at the Sea Cadets. Um, and it will look similar to the current row, rowing club steps. Uh, it will enhance all the water sports. The key thing with all of these outputs from this project is they are all open free of charge to all the communities of Hereford. Um, Left Bank uh, will support all the craft. Both pontoons will extract, uh, attract external users, users such as Duke of Edinburgh, canoe clubs and tourists and links to the new, new pathway and the access ramps. So the pathway and the ramp links the the same on the north side with the new walkway cycle route for greater mobility, uh, including impaired users. It also means there is no requirement to cross the main road going from Belmont or Hunterton into the city. Therefore, we're generating a safer route. The pathway already exists. We're just enhancing that. Uh, for safety and security, we've got the um, CCTV. We're removing all self-seeded vegetation around the rugby club, as I've mentioned. And the driver here is to give all of our communities access to sports on and off the waters, and also links to the Countryside and Waterworks Museum. The power points will be six multi-point power outlets, three on the north side, between the rugby club and the rowing club, and three on the south side. Um, although we may have had an additional one on the north side of the Castle Green after a meeting last week. Uh, and they are for entrepreneurs. It is uh, during the spring, summer and autumn, pop-up cafes can come along, small commercial temporary outlets and supporting river events. And the driver behind this is to encourage people down to, to the river and the river environment and also to increase tourism and the, the local economy for Hereford. How are we going to do it? Well, we initially had a bid of 2 million. Um, it was reduced to 1.6 million by Her Majesty's government. Uh, the Stronger Towns Fund then decided to cut us a further 482,000. So I now have 1.03 million. So delivering all of that is actually quite challenging. Um, however, we can still achieve our strategic aims, but we're always looking for savings. <coughs> Planning permissions are proven to be expensive. And um, as a lot of members of this forum will know, the ecology surveys are coming in even more expensive than uh, we originally budgeted for, which is, is quite amazing actually. Um, but it is a very challenging environment that we are going to be working in. So my timeline, um, I've got to complete a full business case by the end of March. Um, I anticipate further government funding to be released then in June or July. The CCTV, the crane and the pathway, um, I hope will be completed this year. The pontoons, the PowerPoints and the access ramp next year in 2023, the bridge lighting, which is almost the end of the project in 2024. If we make any savings or additional funds um, come along, then we will supply additional lighting and seating along the, the riverbanks uh, for people to have barbecues and just sit there at lunchtime. 
and it's my intention to complete all works by 2024. So to date, I've got 50% of my business case completed. Uh, planning permissions have started and they're going through. <coughs> Consultations have, have commenced um, with uh, external authorities and I've obviously picked up some more from today, which is excellent. Um, so we will be engaging um, even more organizations I did not know actually existed. The tenders go out to the civil engineers either tomorrow or Monday. Uh, and to date, we've had excellent feedback uh, from the communities around Hereford, but we always welcome more because uh, the more information I have, I can use that to inform the full business case submission to the government. And that's it. I whizzed through because I know we were a bit short on time. Well, congratulations, Steve. That was really, really good and concise and to the point. Um, and it goes almost without saying, I think, that you will be extremely interested and your user groups, your anticipated user groups will be extremely interested in water quality. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, that uh, brings uh, the, the speaker session to an end, but we um, would like now uh, to pick up any um, questions which people have. And again, using the word brief, brief comments that people can make. And I'm just going to start off by making a brief comment, which is, is, has struck me as a person who's been interested in agriculture for many years, that the idea of phosphates in particular, um, less worrying maybe the nitrates in, in terms of what I'm about to say, the idea of phosphates being flushed into the sea is quite preposterous because we are going to find in our country and in the world community that phosphorus will become an extremely scarce resource. And one would hope that, the, that there are researches going on which will enable farmers to make better use of their phosphates uh, not only in terms of um, how they, they spread it, but in, in something like a poultry unit, which has a kind of captured um, amount of manure, that that could be turned into a useful agricultural project. And I'd love to see, see more about that. Anyway, that's me having uh, spoken up. Uh, please, others, will you um, raise your questions? I think we may have some in chat, have we, Ruth? Hi, yes, there are some questions in the chat. Do you want to, so Barbara Ferris had the first question. Shall we go to her? Would you like to vocalize it, Barbara, or shall I read it out to you? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm so confused about all the uh, many people working so positively. I have just put in the comment about how really impressive and grateful I am to you all. Um, I had this request from crowdfunding to support an appeal. I thought it was the friends of the Upper Wye, no, of Golden Valley, uh, who had uh, were campaigning against something. Uh, and the judgment by the thing said, if I am wrong, doubtless the appeal court will correct it. So that struck me as wrong, but I think they were suing Hereford Council. Is Jeremy aware of this? And I worry about putting money into something like that when one needs to be putting it into doing all this wonderful work that you're all doing and buying kits to tackle balsam and things like that. You know what I'm talking about. Are you asking me, Barbara? I know you mentioned my name, but I I'm don't not asking you. anybody, but presumably, as you're on the council, you would know uh, <laughs> that somebody's raising money to sue the council for uh, taking something. Uh, they, the, the, this friends of uh, Golden Valley have lost a case to find a, a, a planning application. Uh, as uh, to go through 
without um, the permission about an evaluation of the pollution of the of the water. You don't know anything about it. Shall I just forward it? Oh, look. But I know a little bit about it, but it, it slightly digresses from from the point of this evening. I can say a, a couple of words about it if you like. It's um, a planning ap application for uh, some stock units at Beige Court, uh, Dorston in the Golden Valley was approved in 2019. And that um, a culmination of a number of applications for the same site. And it was challenged by through um, judicial review through by the Golden Valley Action Group, which was defended by by um, by the Heritage Council. Uh, and the um, uh, it, it was found in fa favour of uh, of the applicant. Uh, the, uh, the basis of the challenge uh, was, uh, as I, if I remember, I may be slightly wrong here, but that uh, there hadn't been an appropriate habitats regulations assessment done on it, in view of that uh, the fact that this uh, um, is is within the the catchment, the Y catchment, but it, it all really re was revolved around a determinate a determination as to whether the the river door, which flows into the Mono. Uh, and enters the Y at Monmouth is is part of the catchment or not? Well, I, I would have thought it probably was, but uh, uh, others may know more. And we do oh, actually have uh, uh, the chair of the Nutrient Management Board in, in the room, so I must just be careful what I say because I can very easily be factually incorrect. Okay, I don't know whether anything more. That doesn't really relate to any of the speak the, the, the no, speak no, the talks no. we just heard though. Yeah. It does thank answer you. Barbara's question. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. And uh have we any more questions in the chat or would people okay, like so to raise next... their hand? Oh Tom Tibbetts. Um uh, your... David, there were two more questions in the chat. The next one was actually from Jeremy Milne about um uh, an, an issue close to both our hearts, whether to bash them or to pull them. <laughs> Mm. Jeremy, yeah. Yes, well, uh, it was a it was a question um, of of Nikki really as to uh, I mean obviously mechanically cutting is a lot quicker it takes a tenth yeah. of the time as of pulling it by hand and I just wonder how whether, whether uh, it's it's effective in proportion to the effort. Um, obviously it, not as effective yeah. as pulling, but how <laughs> in view of the um, amount, amount of it we've got to do. Yeah, no, happy happy to give a little input there. Um, yeah, I mean, if if um, there is such huge sort of density of, of balsam and, um, you know, the, the scale of the task is so daunting to, to actually get in there and get pulling as, as a volunteer group, then um, subject to the terrain being being OK for, for um, um, mechanical uh, method, then, um, yeah, it's definitely worth doing for sure. But the um, really key thing is that the stems um, have got to be cut right low down um, at ground level. Um, they've got to be cut well below the, the lowest node. And if they're not, it, it's just pretty pointless actually undertaking it. Um, that's why pulling is so good because you're, you're pulling up the whole root and then snapping the stem below the node, the, the, the um, lowest node. Um, so you're, you're, you can be very sure that um, you're being, you know, 100% effective at, at getting rid of that plant. But um, as long as you, you know, if you've got a good, good, nice flat terrain and you can get in there with a strimmer or slashes and things and make sure that you're, you're really getting it really low down, then um, it's a fabulous um, method um, of control. And uh, it does result in really good regeneration and um, a regrowth of, of native species following that, that work. Um, but you've got to be a bit careful. Um, if the ground's uneven, then it's it's much harder to get that really low cut. Um, and also, you know, if there are some seedlings coming through, um, you're getting a lot of vegetation falling on to those those seedlings and sort of covering them all up, and they're going to pop up later on. Um, so you might easily miss um, plants um, with with um, mechanical control. Um, but no, it's definitely worth doing. Definitely. Okay, Very thank you, fun. Nikki. I was just a, a, bit, a bit concerned by, because uh, we were doing it on Bartonshire Meadows, which is very low lying, very susceptible to flooding. That by by yeah. pulling it, we expose a lot, a, a lot, a lot of our soil to to um, erosion. But um, we, yeah. we, will, we will we will do what you recommend. I'm sure it will be be the best. 
Well, ho yeah. hopefully, if, if, if pulled at, at the right time, then there's there's enough time for, for native species to, to start to regenerate before um, sort of the, the head, height of winter and hopefully some stabilizing uh, vegetation can, can take hold. So David, right. there was just a comment oh. from Elaine in the chat about the planning permission, and then that's all the questions in the chat. Okay, Elaine. Oh, no, I mentioned the planning application for anyone who wanted to object tonight when they've finished. Uh, it's in the chat box. But could I just ask Nikki, I know others have got their hand up, but Nikki, last year we pulled it up, we broke the stem, and then I found the thing was lying on the ground, and a month later it had started to regrow. And I don't know if there's any way around that, but just to say this stuff is as a survival instinct like nothing at all it's extraordinary <laughs> it really is extraordinary plant yeah i mean if, if you are finding that then try and make sure that those roots are disposed of uh, off the soil so they're um, often we, we hang them just you know in in branches and put them over tree trunks and put them on on boulders and things like that so um I mean, certainly if it's it's you know good weather uh, which hopefully it is when you're out pulling, um, then those roots will dry out and die off really quickly. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really important. I mean, you can pile up the, the stems um, and they, they should just compost down and break down. But the, it's, the, yeah, the root system and that first node, if you can make sure that it's just, just off the soil, um, then that should, yeah, make sure that it won't reroot. But of course, once you have cleared an area, you're, you've opened it right up to uh, being recolonized and, and having new seedlings popping up with the sudden burst of sunshine. So yeah, it's, it's all important to, to get back out there and get pulling it up again, but it is worth it. And it sounds like you're doing amazing work. I am really impressed with the amount you did last year. And this, this coming year sounds like you, you've got even greater plans. So I'm really excited. I hope, okay. hope we can keep in touch. And um, yeah, I'd love to get your feedback on the toolkit and just hear about what you're doing. and. Yeah, keep in touch. Thank you, Nikki. I'm just going to make a, a, a comment before asking Tom to make his point. But um, if the balsam is mixed up with stinging nettles, then that presents quite a challenge, doesn't it? It does. I, I would recommend getting in there and, and pulling it and just covering up well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, stinging nettles obviously have, have wildlife value. So, you know, if you can can leave those um, yeah. where they are, then uh, that, that would be great. And um, yeah, if you can get in there and sort of selectively pull up the balsam as best you can without getting completely stung to bits, then <laughs> yeah, just, just good PPE, good, you know, good gloves and uh, covered up arms and legs. Um, important plus you know there's lots of wasps and bees around with balsam so it's, it's important to be covered up as well from from that perspective from stings mm -hmm. okay well thanks for your practical advice now <laughs> and, and earlier tom would you like to make your point thank you chair i just wanted to respond to barbara's point briefly um uh particularly because you you you, you wrote that you 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 had some misgivings because you thought it was a biz bizarre decision, but uh, what a waste to, to contribute to a further appeal. We'll be grateful for the right of appeal because quite soon judicial review will probably be watered down by this present government to the point where we won't have any right of appeal in the future. So um, uh, I, I, would, I would ask you to re-examine your particular opinion on that front. And I, I don't know much about the case, but what I do know is that Herefordshire Council successfully argued in court that the door, which drains into the mono, which drains into the Y, did not form part of the Y catchment. Um, in which case, my perception of what a river catchment is has obviously been wrong for quite some time. Um, but, uh, apparently, when when the Crown Court judge made that judgment, um, when when they appealed, the the, the judge hearing the appeal thought they had a very reasonable chance of success on the basis that uh, in most people's books the catchment is indeed the entire tributary system leading into a river. Uh, I also want to make one other point if I may chat um, about, about farming and phosphates um, and I don't want to come across at all as anti-farmer. Um, I know full well that we, we as a we as a citizen science group and as a campaign group won't have any success by alienating and making enemies of other parts of the community. 
But, but I have learned from Avara Foods, which is the joint venture between Sun Valley Foods and Cargill, which is the world's biggest private corporation, um, that one fifth of the food that is fed to all of the chickens in the Y catchment is imported from South America and is almost certainly imported from plantations of soy where previously rainforest and pristine Cerrado stood. Um, and so it has an enormously damaging environmental effect in South America. And what is more, uh, when you import all this food and, and feed it to chickens, and bear in mind there are about 20 million chickens living in the white catchment any any time, um, uh, most of that food obviously passes through the chicken. Some of it is absorbed into the chicken and becomes flesh and bone, um, but a great deal of it comes out the back of the chicken. And poultry manure is known for being four times richer in phosph phosphate than, for example, cattle manure. So phosphate manure is, uh, sorry, poultry manure is very, very potent uh, phosphate fertilizer. And be because of this simple fact that 357,000 chickens worth of food a week is being imported into the catchment, most of it is coming out of the back of the, kitchen, of the chicken. And, and that manure is not being exported out of, out of the catchment, it is being disposed of through spreading. And I don't want to give you the awful numbers that I've calculated, but, but it, there is significant overspreading of phosphate happening because it's, it, it's not being treated as, as a fertilizer, it's being treated as a waste and just needs to be got rid of. That is causing the problems, to my mind, um, of this, this ever-increasing soil saturation within the soil, phosphate saturation within the soil, which ultimately leads to, to runoff. And the data I've been catching from the Brook I'm monitoring uh, is indicative of runoff. So we, 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 have, we measure in dry periods the sort of baseline phosphate levels, um, which are fairly low, um, lower than the legal limit on, on our brook at the moment. But when it rains, we very quickly see a huge spike in the phosphate. And that is because the phosphate is not coming out of sewage works. Normally, when, when you have sewage emissions of phosphate, in heavy rainfall, the phosphate concentration in the river actually decreases because of the huge dilution of that phosphate by the, by, by the additional rain. Uh, but where you have soil runoff and soil saturation runoff, uh, during heavy rainfall periods, the, the phosphate concentration that you measure spikes, and that's because of the agricultural runoff that's happening. So we think we're gathering quite solid evidence that shows that, that the phosphate problem is coming predominantly from, from agricultural runoff. And, and although, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way in favour of, of dumping raw sewage in rivers, I think in this particular part of the world, that is not actually the main problem. Right. OK, well, thanks for that information, Tom. Elissa, um, you have a point or a question? Uh, yeah, a couple, couple of things. Um, and, and I'd also like to pay tribute to Tom. He's done an amazing job. A big fan. Well done, Tom. Um, the, um, you, you, you raised the, the question of you know, why are they wasting all the phosphate? Why can't they do something with it? There, there are various um, uh, technologies that, were, that are being looked at uh, to take the phosphate out of the manure and uh, and have it in a usable form so that it's not wasted because you're quite right it's a it's a valuable and finite resource um and the sooner we stop uh flushing it down the bristol channel the better um because it does a lot of harm on the way and the point that tom was making about the um the excess that the, there's also been very interesting work done by the university of lancaster uh, which has uh, looked at substance flow analysis and come to the conclusion that we have a 3000 ton excess um in 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 terms of you know phosphate coming in being used going out uh, 3000 tons uh is is being spread in excess which would be equivalent to something i guess in the region of about 200 million tons of farmyard manure um so that it supports what what tom was saying um and that and also what tom tom's observations about um the 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 um the impact of peak rainfall events um is something that's observable throughout the catchment um in terms of phosphate in the river it increases when it should be decreasing which is a a telltale sign um i'm i'm interested in the uh i i was involved in the the mono uh balsam bashing uh project and, and to anyone who's doing balsam bashing 
just to give you some some hope you know yeah it works is it the bit where, where i was involved is still pretty much balsam free um after well, i don't know it must be about five or six years ago um maybe even longer um i'm also one of my other jobs is i chair the uh, like internal drainage board and we've got a fair amount of balsam up there so maybe nikki if you could uh you know get in touch with me and i can get you in touch with the area engineer maybe we can work something out on that catchment because obviously we're in there doing work all the time um that would be really helpful and to steve taylor i was just going to suggest if he hasn't already contacted the YASC foundation it would be worth uh having them as a consultee thank you and thank you for a really interesting evening thank you well, thank you very much. And uh, did you have a point that you wanted to make, Ruth? Uh, yeah, Ruth, I saw your mechanical hand raised at one point. Did I? No, it's my mechanical clapping, if appreciation. Ah, <laughs> good. Okay, I misinterpreted. Right now, um, the, there may well be more questions. So I, I, I hope that we've dealt with in, in the main part with them. Uh, and I'd like at this point, it being just after nine, and we're, we've caught up well, but we're still a little behind schedule. However, for a few more minutes, bear with us, because Elaine will um, have uh, some things to say to us about coming to conclusions. Okay, thank you, David. And, and thank you to our three speakers, our, our four speakers, sorry. It's, it's been really, really interesting. And thank you to everyone who's come along. I, I know it's been, um, we've, we've covered a lot. It's been a good overview, and yet we seem to have been able to look at quite a bit of detail as well. So I, I really do thank you. Uh, we just wanted to finish by just giving you a few dates so that we can carry on talking about this and, and meeting together and coordinating plans going forward. Uh, so we have three opportunities. I've just put them in the chat box. They'll also be on our notice board, our Facebook page, and probably in an email I send everyone at some point soon. Saturday 26th of February, uh, 10.30, some of us are meeting together to help just tidy up the riverside path that goes from Victoria Bridge to Vicarage Road. Uh, Balfour Beatty have left a lot of branches they've cut down. There's a lot of sort of rubbish from, from the winter, a bit of litter. Um, so we thought in talking with Jeremy about it, we could get together a working group. That's 10.30 to 12.30, having a look at the Riverside Path there, probably meeting up at Victoria Bridge. Um, just cutting a little bit back, just tidying it up. It'd be great to have more of you come along with loppers and secateurs and rubbish bags and gloves. Then our follow-up meeting about talking about the why, and this time having the chance for Herefordshire Council to talk about what they've been doing, which is, which is quite a lot, <laughs> um, including writing to the government, I know. Um, Jeremy will be talking about that. Steve will get a bit more chance to get feedback for the um, Stronger Towns Fund Wyside project, this million pound project. So it's really worth having a bit more chance to talk about. And also a chance for us to talk about um, how we might coordinate a bit more citywide with the balsam bashing. Perhaps you'll have had a bit of chance to, to think about where you'd like to, to go with your organization in terms of the river bank and the balsam. And then finally, on Saturday, May the 14th, that's the start of the Invasive Species Week. I did notice Nikki was saying it appears in March and April, but your Invasive Species Week is May. So hopefully, um, May 14th, start of that, maybe as Jabber, we might start over at Bishop's Meadow by Victoria Bridge, maybe bring some refreshments, get a bit of a working group together there, maybe have a picnic, whatever. <laughs> make it a nice morning over by the beaches there it's very shallow very accessible very gentle um that might be a, a nice place to start um may 14th and also hopefully there'll be other groups doing a bit on the riverbank maybe the sea cadets uh, steve um or the rowing club or the rugby club or friends of castle green i don't know but it'd be good to get a few more coordinated 
So those are our dates. Keep talking to us. Our emails are chair at jabber.org.uk. Mine's um, secretary at jabber.org.uk. You can message us. You know where we are. We really want to help coordinate a bit more in Hereford, which falls a bit between the gaps here, really. Um, and we want to just keep doing what we can to raise awareness and generate action on our bit of the river. So, and if you have any ideas, just let us know. Things we've not noticed or things that you might do and we could support. Uh, it's very much a community project. We're very much a community group. Thank you. David? Yes, well, I'm about to ask Ruth to close the meeting. But I just want to reiterate the thanks to our speakers um, and thank you very much for your really rather successful efforts at packing into a small space uh, an awful lot of uh, information and ideas and encouragement. And um, with that, and thank our um, people who've come as well, I'm going to just ask Ruth now to close the meeting with you, Ruth. Thank you, and goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.